Uh, welcome and good morning to everyone. Um, just as a brief introduction to today's event. Uh, I think I was lucky to be here, I think it was five months ago, when there was a special centenary presentation uh, lecture given on a Saturday morning to the Rand Revolt of 1922. And then funny enough, I never knew that till this day, it was actually Jan Smuts declared martial law on my birthday in 1922, it was the 10th of March. We actually brought this copy along, I'll just because it's actually the first two questions uh, to William. Um, uh, his grandfather, Morris Kentridge, uh, published this incredibly interesting biography, I recall, I think in 1964. And uh, William's grandfather was a very central figure. There were many people who played a role, but in this case, as a lawyer on the side and in defense of labor and of the miners who were being marginalized by the new legislation. So, of course, defending against Smuts' uh, legislation and also the, uh, the mining houses and then certain of the trade unions. And to boot, this is, will be in my first question. I mean, it was shocking to me when I looked at it more carefully to realize that, um, well, James, if we can move to the first, the first page, that in uh, Morris uh, displaying such bravery was actually not only arrested, his car was also shot at, um, sort of in the area of Kensington. Luckily, he wasn't wounded or hit uh, because the martial law had literally been declared. And all he was trying to do was go home to get a change of clothing. And to go from one suburb to another was literally a criminal offence, hence uh, the police shot at him. But to boot, he was then detained and arrested for 17 days and held ostensibly at the fort. And I think why this is also interesting, I've never spoken to William about this, is that William's father, so Sidney Kentridge, was born later in that year on the 5th of November. And this happened, I think um, it's there, uh, Morris was... Um, arrested on the 13th of March, so one assumes that uh, William's, William's grandmother may, I'm, I'm not sure if this is accurate though, she might very well have uh, known she was, uh, she, was, well, she was pregnant. So I was always uh, amazed at the fact that, um, that, you know, not that you can see what would happen, but that at such a fragile time in any young couple's uh, uh, relationship, especially with a child on the way, that, uh, you know, the father was actually put in such a, a precarious position, actually sat, uh, sat in jail. So, really the first question to you, William, on that uh, context, I know you were very close to your grandfather. Did the family, or did he ever, or your grandmother, did they ever, or your father, more importantly, did they ever speak about that event? Well, my grandfather died when I was nine, so I didn't have, that event was never mentioned, but my, my grandfather, Morris, never drove. My grandmother, May, did all the driving, so she was driving the car when they were shot at. But she was, I think, the first or second woman in Johannesburg to get a driving license. And in that <laughs> era, because she was a woman, when they did the driving test, she was not asked to reverse. <laughs> um, but the, there was always in the, in the house, in my parents' house, the little uh, prisoner's ticket that my grandfather had that was framed and put up in their house. So this idea of him being in prison during the time was part of family folklore. I remember hearing that he was, at that time, the, the white mine workers, um, and remember they'd struck because there was new legislation to allow black mine workers to do work that had been previously the terrain of the white mine workers. So it was a mixture between a class war and a different racial uh, conflict. So it was, you know, typically Johannesburg with a complex set of conflicts intersecting. Um, but they had various, there were strike breakers um, and there were kangaroo courts of the strikers to try these strike breakers and some of the strike breakers were executed by the strikers. And my grandfather was asked to sit as a judge because he was a lawyer on one of these kangaroo courts, on one of these courts, unofficial courts tribunals and he refused but there was a colleague of his also a sort of left-wing lawyer who did and the colleague was subsequently after the suppression of the Rand revolt arrested charged with murder as the uh, judge in this case and in fact executed hmm. for doing it so there was always a sense of oh, we just escaped that one in that in that uh, in that era my grandfather's hard to understand he'd been born in Lithuania 
but as a very as a child he'd gone to Sunderland part of the journey from Lithuania to Johannesburg via England and he went to university in uh, St Andrews so he was almost incomprehensible it was a mixture of this heavy <laughs> Lithuanian Yiddish Scottish accent <laughs> um, but he used to give three-hour political speeches to his constituency that must have been intolerable. But William, am I right? He was MP of... Um, he was the uh, me Member of Parliament for Troyville, Troyville from I think 1915, from the first sitting of the Union Parliament mm. until he retired in 1953. He was a lawyer, but essentially he was a Member of Parliament. First for the Labour Party and then for the uh, United Party. And so all my childhood, I remember hearing various members, mainly of the Jewish community in Johannesburg, who wouldn't speak to the family because he had left the Labour Party to join SMA. So here we have, it's a very, uh, I think William at the time, I think William was 21 when this liner cut was made. It was, uh, it was made by William in 1976. Maybe just to add, it wasn't really uh, any part of the discussion today, but What's so interesting about this image being commissioned to do the catalogue resonate is that it's always been understood as this final image as you see it on the screen. But then literally in late uh, 2020, after the, I think the first hard uh, COVID lockdowns, it's proverbially like being a in, uh, uh, private investigator. You sort of, you've done all the initial work, but you, you literally start to turn sometimes the most obvious stones. I was just convinced I was maybe missing something. And there was a folder in, uh, William's studio that said early work done at school and it's so interesting when I opened the folder to find what they call in printmaking a uh, seven well that this is the seventh and final stage as they call it but that's how it was always considered to exist we found impressions of that William made of the six of the six earlier images as he progressed in getting to the final state of this image so that's largely what the process of a catalogue resume does but I remember um, um, William, William's younger brother, Matthew, uh, he did a, an incredibly good book about six or seven years ago called The Soho Films. And obviously he's a perfect person to write a book of this nature because being William's brother has a lot of uh, family insights. And he mentioned something about so this, this, this work is based on a photograph of, as you see it, that uh, was obviously hanging in Morrison May's house. And then the family would go for Shabbat on Friday and I think, uh, I'm all right, William, you and uh, Matthew would sort of laugh a little at the fact that your grandfather was typical of the day, but literally walk, would go to Musenberg Beach in a full suit and in Homburg in 1933. So I mean, it, yeah, I mean, the reason for doing the print, is that all right? Are you hearing? Okay. The reason for doing the print, I suppose, was this anomaly of what it was to be on a beach in your full suit and your waistcoat and your tie and your... Homburg, and it was so much saying as a fish out of water. I mean, the wrong place for him to, for him to be. And later on, this image came back into other films, into other. So, Musenberg was not was the childhood place where my father and his family went on holidays. It wasn't where we went in my childhood. But that sense of the beach huts and that formality was. It was kind of irresistible without asking the question: What specifically did it mean? was the absurd, the absurdity of not wearing a swimming costume but wearing a suit. Also before I move on, uh, William, well actually we've got this slide here. I do want to of course, um, of course speak about your mom and uh, dad in some depth. I'd also like to uh, mention your grandmother who I know uh, very little about but on your mother's side, uh, Irene, because there's another um, sort of first if you like um, in the sense that I think she was the first woman in South Africa to be called to the bar in, nine, I think it's 1927. So could you maybe speak a little about her? Uh, yes, in my childhood, my grandmother was someone who was forever writing a book. And there'd be pages and pages and then enormous quantities of sticky tape and cutting out. And it was a book about psychology and associations. And it was, we realized afterwards it was a book that was never going to get finished. And it was years and years in the making. But early on, she had been, uh, I think, in the same way as my paternal grandmother was the second person to, be, to get a driving license. I think my grandmother was the first woman in South Africa to be admitted as an advocate and the second, person in the British, second woman in the British Empire to be admitted. The law just changed at that, at that uh, period. But in, certainly when I knew her, 
she was very much grandmother and crazy book writer <laughs> and not uh, a lawyer at all. Um, my mother's father was an attorney and he was an attorney all his, all his, all his life. Did the, um, so from your side, from your, uh, Morris and from your father's side, did, they, did the Kentridges know the Geffens for a long time or did they meet at university? Because it's just to say no, it's, a, it's, it's a, a portrait. I mean my, my father was, had been in the war so he was eight years older than my mother and I think he was going out with her older sister, who was his age, and then met the younger sister who was <laughs> much younger. And, um, and there was always some needle between my mother and her sister. <laughs> um, she was interesting also, just my mother was, did many different things, I don't know if we're going to get onto that later, mm -hmm. but will, yes. she was a lawyer, she was an advocate, she went to Wits at night school in the evenings also while my father was practicing and she got her LLB at Wits and went to the bar, but found very much in the 19, late 50s and 60s when she was practicing that it was very difficult for a woman to make her way in the legal profession and then what she was given essentially were divorce cases. That's what women advocates, their bread and butter was doing divorce cases. So at a certain point she left the bar and as she always said it was important, her view was that women needed to create their own jobs, to write them and invent them and so she first started by changing legal education at Fitz University starting the campus law clinic which gave practical experience to law students in the work of uh, community legal questions. And s springing on from that later in the late 1970s, founding the Legal Resources Center, which also changed the way law was practiced in Johannesburg and in a very significant way. So that legal thread sort of went in different directions across the family. 